Welcome to FOSS North 2020, a virtual event. I'd like to thank our sponsors and our partners. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Dimitar, and I'm here to present you the, my presentation for cybersecurity in RARGS. So who am I? I am senior developer for motion software. I have over 10 years of experience as a software developer. In the past, I've been working for different big corporations like VMware, Prozeban. I was working for small startups too. And my main hobbies are cryptocurrencies and drone automation. I have many different projects around them. And this is what I fill my time with. My main languages are JavaScript, that I'm using for my daily basis projects, Node.js for backend, for the front end there are many different frameworks, and for mobile, React Native, mainly. And of course, Dart, because Footer is the new hot kit in the So the agenda, what I'm going to present you today are, is split on three different layers. The first one is the React security vulnerabilities, which is based on cross-site scripting, broken authentication, SQL injection, XML externality entity attack, which is kind of rare in the Node.js, but it still happens, the zip slip, and the arbitrary code execution. I'm going to show you some best practices for RAC.js security, how to secure base authentication for the RAC app, whitelist and blacklist validation for who is calling your application, and why we should always use the principle of the least privilege when allowing any connections to your database. I'm going to show you how to control the risk of NPM dependencies and how to check if something wrong is going to one of your projects. And that's the overview. I'm going to start with the cross-site scripting attacks. The main thing about them is that it is one of the most used attack these days. It is a simple attack where the hacker is using your web service or website to harm to somebody else. In most cases, he is trying to inject some kind of malicious executable, for example, image or some kind of script inside of your forum of your website or inside of his, for example, footer of a forum account. And he can use it to some kind of steal something from the other users. Once they execute the script, the image or something, he can actually execute any kind of script from the site of the visitor and steal his cookie or some information from the site. I'm going to give you some white example. How can I share my screen? I think there's a button uh, to the right of uh, the sort of camera logo. Yeah. So, okay, I had an error in the browser. I'm going to refresh my session. Sorry about that. I had to restart my browser, sadly. No worries. I on the Mac. So I'm going to show a simple example about a simple attack. This is a simple Node.js server, which contains just a standard express with session, server static, and some basic information about the session with some basic scripts inside of it. As you can see here, it is just a simple response, and I'm going to start it up. Once you start it up, you have a simple form. Here you can write something like test one, two, three, four, or something like that. Here, as you can see, whatever you write in the browser, it is directly rendered inside the screen. It's not sanitized or something, which is kind of dangerous. I prepared one example here, which is just an image, which is with source that doesn't exist, some on error handle with alert, and I'm going to sanitize it for a browser and try it in the top. As you can see here, it was it directly dumped my session because the image that I just showed you is actually containing the document cookie. In that way, somebody who sent you that link 
can actually steal some cookie or some information from your site or from your users. That's the main reason why everybody it's mandatory to actually catch every single attribute that's coming from the backend inside the front end because it can be some kind of middleman attack or some kind of spam attack to some user. And you have always sanitized every single row that comes from the backend. You can handle it in different ways in React, in different ways in Angular. For example, in React is handled by default to some extension. But it's always a good idea to handle that kind of attacks. They're simple and they're really dangerous. I'll continue the presentation. Authentication. This is the next thing as a big security risk for most of the applications. For example, here I showed a say just a simple session inside the browser. It was really modern back in the days for different applications. These days almost everybody moved to out too, but there are still sites with a really bad authentication, especially the government ones in most cases. I'm going to give a simple demo about it. To demo too. As you can see here, here is just a simple application with some basic router, some basic handling, and some basic user. As you can see here, the website is simple user interface with a simple login form and everything looks simple. When you try to write something which is not existing, it, it is telling you that it doesn't exist and you can't do anything with it. But when you try to check to where it is sending the request, it is to some users. Every single person who is trying to do harm to your website is going to try to check the different endpoints of the website and is going to try to do something better. As you can see here, he already found that on users there is something happening. So you can actually try to add, add user, or you can actually try many different endpoints with just a simple crawler to find which is the place to send the user. He can actually check what requirements does have that endpoint with simple experimenting. It can do a lot of harm. Of course, on the most old websites, everyone is going to try slash admin. In this application, which is really badly secured because authentication is really old school and without any normal authentication, somebody enters admin and enters into your admin. This is a good example for a bad authentication system and bad protection for website. There are many web sites which are based on some of the, let's say, that older CMS systems that were built on websites with really awful admin screen. For example, somebody can write admin admin or the default users. It can enter and do a lot of harm. For example, in this case, somebody enters here. He writes some kind of account. And he directly enters inside the application, which is not really good for anybody in this case. So this is one of the reasons why you always have to add as much security as possible on your website. The best approach here is with OAuth 2 these days because it's the most used one, or you can use some third-party password verification tool. And I'm going to show the next one. The SQL injection, it is one of the most used attacks for WordPress websites because, let's face it, in most cases they just use some already done plugins. Most of the plugins have vulnerabilities that are shared on many different places and many people know what kind of vulnerabilities has that plugin and also how to attack them. How the SQL injection works? Somebody identifies a vulnerable website where you can actually check and play a little bit with the attributes that are sent to the backend. He's inserting his malicious SQL query inside of the database, and the database is actually returning some information or granting access to that website. 
I'm going to show a small demo about that. As you see here, it is a simple website with SQLite, which is working in the memory mode. It is not targeting any database. It has a simple login form, which checks is it authenticated or no. It is just a simple get all users, which as you can see in this example, it is directly parsing what is sent with the SQL, which is not good approach. I'm going to show you what are the bad sides of it. So good second. We should start it now. Hopefully. As you can see here, it is having some protection. You can write in the top admin or anything and you can't enter the side of it but what is the big problem as you can see here it is directly parsing everything which is sent to it it is directly submitting everything to send to it directly to the backend as you can see here it is directly parsing the password for example if somebody tries to add something like this or not password or something you know you can actually destroy the table. He can download something from the table. He can manipulate the response any way it wants, especially if you return directly what is called here. It is That's the main reason why you always have to check every single variable which is sent to the database. You have to validate it. You have to pass some regex if you want to say to do it on your site and not use some package or middleman who actually fix the attributes that are sent to the database. You can, must always verify that everything going to the database is fine. You must never, ever put it like this. Because the main problem is that here you can, somebody is going to write, like in this case, or not password, just to verify that something is happening. But he might, he might actually dump all the tables of the database. And after that, he might just delete those tables and make a really huge DDoS problem to the person. Continuing with the XML external entity attack. These days, it is rare for the Node.js community to actually use XMLs. But back in the days when the standard was PHP, there were many attacks with the XML external entities. How it works? You are sending XML to the backend, so the backend can actually work over it, parse it, and get some information from the server and return it to the user. In most cases, it was used to have some kind of hole, which is the session of the user. It contains profile pictures, etc. And you just check what is incoming, you return what is required, and it was working really simple. And, but in some cases, you can actually edit some part of the XML that is sent to the backend. The backend, if it doesn't verify everything and parse it directly, it might be a huge problem. I'm going to show you some code to it. And just prepare a simple bat XML here file. As you can see, it is just reading the file system. It is starting some kind of process with the etc password and the, every single password to the user. This is a really simple attack, but if you check in some kind of websites that have some vulnerabilities registered inside of it, you're going to find out that almost all of those attacks are still inside the library, and you can always do those attacks in, for every Node.js library. There are always many different leakage vulnerabilities, and it's really rare when somebody fix them or accept pull request to fix them. So you must always verify that every single library you're using doesn't have any vulnerabilities that are over low, because let's face it, like ADM, SQL has even critical vulnerabilities that stay for over a year, and it's one of the most used libraries. So, I'm going to continue with the next topic. Zip-step exploit. 
one of the most used back in the days attack. It is still modern these days. It was used for many big tech companies. Back in the days, there were a couple of reports that most of the leaked information for Gravatar were actually happen because of that. It was, it was, of course, rumors. It's not completely verified and everything is not really sure about it, but it's really used one. How does Zip Sleep work, actually? I'm going to show you just a simple intro about it. So, here, as you can see, you get a simple Node.js application. It is really simple. Adam on Zip is the most used Zip controller. It is almost everyone is using it if it has to work with Zips. It's just a simple Zip file. And, of course, it is just dumping it inside the folder. I'm going to show you here how the whole thing works. When you start the process, you can see that there one of the entries is really strange. It looks strange to everybody. And it directly executed it. When I run the entry and I start it like that, you want to see that it just dumped a text file inside one of my root folders. For example, as a developer, I always work on elevated permissions for the system because I don't want to always write sudo. There are many people like this. And this attack is really easy to be done against those people because everybody, when he is working with elevated permissions, give access to all of his folders. If you're using some kind of not very defended system, for example, even when I'm using Mac in this case, it automatically deployed everything there. If you are actually changing some kind of you know, ETC Apache 2 files or some kind of service which is executed when the system starts, you can actually do a lot of harm to some website, to some client, or you can just start some kind of script that is downloading some information from the server. For example, some database information. Of course, it is going to be locked, but you have all the time on the world to actually steal what you want from it. Of course, even if you run it from the system on a hyper in the Mac, you're going to get the same result because it is not very well protected, let's face it. I'm going just to show you with the finder. And I'm going to run it. As you saw, it is unzipping everything and everything is sent. So nobody's protecting you against that one. Nobody. I'm going to continue with another example. Arbitrary code execution. It, back in the days when Node.js was more green than now. It was one of the most used attacks against Node.js. What is the arbitrary code execution? It is when somebody is sending you some kind of hidden function or some kind of hidden controller that your code is going to execute and have some kind of strange behavior. I say for that somebody can, might try to steal something, somebody might just want to dump what you have in the server, somebody is going to just try to steal the user password file to get some access to the server. I'm going to show you just a simple example with it. So, here. As you see, there is one serialized function. I just wrote it so I can serialize this code. As you can see, it is a simple child process code that is just dumping what's inside the folder. It is not something da damaging, it's not something bad. As you can see here, it is a simple server. In this case, I just created a fake cookie, which everybody can do in his curl request or postman request or insomnia request. In most cases, you're expecting the cookie like that. In this case, I just replaced it so we can test it a little bit easier. As you can see, what it's doing is actually creating some buffer as a string. It unserialize what is actually sent as information and returns the user. Just a simple function without any different problems. But it's using the not serializer. I'm going to show you the result of that. As you hear, we just fired the whole thing. 
it just sent hello world and nothing too special. But if you see in the backend, it was executed. I dumped everything inside of my root directory. If here was not just OS, it could be RM, RF with a star or some damaging function that can do a lot of harm for a simple server, which is not protected that much from elevated permissions and etc. This is a really used library. If, so, if you spend some time in Google with that, you're going to find out that it is still used for a lot of people. Every single week, 1,000 people is not a small number. But if you check out here in the different issues, you're going to have a really bad result with I see critical error, every single version, arbitrary code execution. Nobody handles it. There are multiple pull requests, and the patch is kind of left over to leave what's left of its life. So that's one of the main reasons why you always have to approach every single package with some kind of, you know, fear about what is going to introduce because there is no way to protect yourself for the first zero day attack. Because every single package in one moment of its life has a zero day breach that has some really bad problem. Everybody knows the bleeding attack on the Node.js and you know, that's why you must always approach every security with a lot of respect. In this case, we're going to, go to show the OAuth 2. How the OAuth 2 is working? It's really simple, but it's really well designed. When somebody is trying to connect to server, he first sends authorization request. If that server doesn't find OK JSON web token or some kind of authorization, it returns that the user must be registered or login. Once you log into that web server, the web server returns some JSON web token, some refresh token, and some information about the user. On every second request or every additional request you're sending, you always attach your token. The server is comparing your token to what it has inside of it. Verify that you're the user, you're good to go. And of course, it can actually have some permissions based on that user. And everything is looking kind of smoothly and everything is kind of protected well. I'm going to give you a, just a simple example about some application which is okay protected. As you can see here, um, this is a simple example where the application is kind of protected. You have some private key which is created to sign every single web token. You have some public key, which is the one you are authorizing everything with. You have a simple binary with the basic creation of JS server. You have, of course, passport, which is one of the most used libraries for authorization inside the JavaScript. It is just a simple tool that can grant you a lot of protection. It is with the JSON basic strategy, basic strategy. So you can actually check every single authentication against the server with just its expiry date, some digging inside the database about that user, and you just compare the token to that user based on, in some cases, the token is created from the user password with some salt and pepper, and you verify it by it. In some other cases, you just create, create it on different custom level. You can always do it in whatever you want. Of course, there are some preferred ways to be done, but you have some flexibility here. As you see, on every single request, which is not the login, you just attach that you need to authenticate the JSON web token and have kind of okay security in this case. So the second good practice is the white list and the black list. It is one of the better approach how to protect your server, how the whole thing works. You have some blacklist server, which is actually some list of different IPs or different MAC addresses, some definitions about different users that are going to your site. 
The biggest plus of the blacklisting is that you can always have some automation. And if somebody is trying to do something bad to your website, for example, he's sending more than 100 requests per second, or he's doing something which looks kind of harm, you can push them inside the blacklist for like 15 seconds or 20 seconds or even more. GitHub, for example, if you try to spam it up, it puts you in a blacklist for 15 minutes. Your IP is there. It doesn't matter if you're using another computer because, you know, the IP is in most cases of the router and it's same for all the devices inside the home network. And you're completely blocked for every single API request. You just receive that your request is not going to be, it's failed. It's not going to be checked from the server. The whole idea is that on default, you have a low access. If somebody is going to do something, you define it as a threat and block it. That's the whole idea of the blacklist. The second one is the whitelist. The whitelist, in most cases, is that you have some kind of clients or some kind of partners that you know that they have some kind of okay security. You can know, you can never be completely sure about it, but you have some kind of, you know, you trust them that they're not going to do something stupid against you. You add them to the whitelist. The whole idea is that if the user is inside the whitelist, he's not going to be blocked in any occasion from the blacklist. In that case, you can have, for example, you're owning some kind of collector company, have some partners, for example, Sixth, which is a big company with a lot of different fees to be collected from problematic clients, in one moment of the day, for example, 3 a.m. in the morning, they are sending every information they get from the last day, which in some cases might be five, ten thousand problems, sending a huge request to your site. It is like a DDoS attack. Every single blacklist is going to block it completely. But you know, it is not an attack. It is in okay time of the day. and. You believe it is okay, so that's why it's in the whitelist. It's never going to be blocked, and accept the whole traffic, even if it's just a DDoS attack in some cases. The best practice for connection to the database it's always use the principle of least privilege. It is one of the most important things because many people are attaching to their applications an admin user, which is really dangerous. That's the main reason why you always create some kind of model. The whole idea is that that model is with the least privilege possible. They are like just a read only with a limitation how much can read, with limitation what it can dig inside. And for every different case, which is specific, for example, some client which needs more permissions, for example, he must dig inside a specific table for something, you elevate permission. Of course, you must always monitor what he's doing because he might not dig only in his table and you can't completely control the permissions for most of the database. But you can still have some kind of control over it. For example, if your application is going only to read and dump some information on the screen, you don't need read access. If your application is going to fill some database but it's not going to show anything to the front end, you don't need read access, you only need to write access. In that way, you can actually protect yourself if somebody, in some case, is able to actually enter your server by some hacky way or he does some problem. You can still protect yourself if you have some safety. It's not big safety, but it's still something. One of the big pluses of it is that you can have some kind of, you know, fewer reliabilities because you have some kind of limitation. You Believe that nobody with that information is going to do some problem. For example, if you have some developers and they have to check some problem on the white user, it's not going to give them admin rights. You are going to give them some kind of read rights with like 24 hours cron job that is going to deactivate them. And you're going to be kind of safe, you know. Web application firewall, the other DevOps tool that can actually save your application from a lot of problems. The idea behind the web application firewall is that in some cases you use a third party service like some kind of CDN. In other cases, you use a custom made solution like the Linux tables, where you can actually add some kind of verifications, check, and protect the whole traffic to the server. Because let's face it, there are some open IPs that you can actually connect 
with every single application. There are huge lists in the browser. So you can actually check them up. There are like 20,000 IPs that everybody can use and do harm with them, for example, or you can do it just as a free VPN. But those IPs, for example, it's really good to be blocked for some specific application, for example, banking software, or some place where there is no reason somebody to use them. That's the main idea why many people are creating some custom web firewalls, or they're using some kind of third-party firewalls that have the list of potential problematic IPs and clients, and directly deactivate them, so you can be sure that nobody's going to do any problems to you. The never serialize sensitive date. This is the main reason why I showed you one of the first demo, where you were directly dumping information. You must always, always verify every single information. It is even from the front end side. You can always verify what the client is sending. You can always check what is sending, and you can have some basic protection. Of course, if somebody is going to be okay to do any harm, he's going to directly try to target the backend. But still, you can kind of limit the scale of the attack with simple form validation tools. There are many different form validation tools for React, like Formic, for example. If you're using old school things, you can actually do it with that. What was called jQuery web form validation tool? I think was the plugin that was really modern back in the days and was used for jQuery. You can always have some kind of validation in the front end. Of course, when somebody scans for a backend, you can always do the second check again. You can always verify if there is some kind of additional tax. You can always verify that there is no hidden executable function that is coming from there. You can have some simple security that gives you some guarantees that there won't be any problem from anyone. And you can be kind of assured that nobody is going to do any harm in this case. And we come again to the control the risk of NPM dependencies. Most of those breaches and those examples that I gave you were happening because there were no risk control for NPM dependencies. For example, I'm going to show you just the first one. If we go with the Adam zip, which was, for example, the one I was using for the breaching, as you can see, those people are updating their package every every single month or two. They're keeping it clean and they're solving most of the problems there. As well, the vulnerabilities are coming from old version. But if you even open their package inside the NPM, we're going to find out that it has two million weekly downloads. It's quite a lot used package. If I was to see if I can close here. As you can see, there were vulnerabilities before 5.2. As you can see, there are many people, like 1 million people, every single week, that are downloading a really vulnerable package that can actually do a lot of harm on their server. As you saw, the zip slip attack can actually replace even system files if your Node.js is not with a lot, with really limited capabilities, with really limited user that can't touch anything outside of its scope. And let's face it, most old servers that are using code applications, there are no limited. It is directly run as a standard user, which have a lot of permissions. And as you can see, it can do a lot of harm, only because nobody checked the package and didn't update it. Even the most used package, for example, some huge plugins that are used for most of web websites. For example, uh, WordPress Caruso, I think, was the one that I wrote. Just to find out how is the plugin. For example, this plugin, as far as I check it out, their source code, they were dependent on two vulnerable, pro vulnerable packages that were actually introducing a lot of harm if you manage to do it. The best way to approach this problem and protect yourself is to always spend like one hour per month just to open the packages you have and run npm audit. It's a simple command that verifies all the packages that are used inside the application. It takes some time, but as you see, 
For example, this application that I showed you is showing that the mocha has some exposed to sense information if somebody is trying to dig inside of it. My minimist is actually having another problem, and every single package has some problem, you know. It is if it's a moderate, and as you saw, it's not something problem because you know nobody's going to a wall authorized user to actually use your photo redirects code inside the axios because you're going to disable those things. But of course there is always some kind of risk and you, it is really simple to fix them. If you just write npm audit fix, it takes just some time. It is not a big time as you can see. And as you can see now, everything is clear. There are no issues, no vulnerabilities in Everything is clean. You can actually do it every month just for like 15 minutes to check every single project, verify if there is some problem. Most projects after the zero day attack, nobody can protect you after a zero day attack. It is designed to do a lot of harm. But after a zero day attack, there are many people who are contributing to different pull requests with the different NPM packages. You can just check out their pull request. You directly on their pull request instead of the original package. If it's clean, of course, you're going to check the code inside of it without to be without any problems, of course. And just use it instead of the original patches until it, the pull request is merged. So you can have some basic protection. And of course, there are many different websites. For example, the one I showed you, which is snook.io. You can check inside of it. Yes, every single day, every single leakage that happens they react really fast and they can just show you some information about every single problem with pa package you know you can actually see when it's published when it happened you can check not only anything you can check everything for every single package that is used a lot in the web as you can see the grunt for example it was the it was supported like a couple of days ago that you can actually do directly traversal which is kind of not really fun thing to have so it doesn't take that much time. You can open it once a week for five minutes to verify that the packages you're using, there is nothing damaging here. Of course, if you want to do harm, you can actually get some information from here, but it will be after the zero day attack and probably it's going to be fixed. So you cannot do a lot of harm with it. And that's all for me, folks. Questions and answers. Maybe I should unmute first. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, we had a raised hand by uh, Risto, who I no longer see online. So if you want to ask your question, please re-ask it. Uh, but we can start with uh, Ioana's question. What, what's the best way to find security issues for an application? The best way to find security issues is by digging every single day for like five minutes into different hacker websites. There are many different websites that are free. There you can enter them without even a registration. You can see some database about some attacks that were shared. Of course, you won't be able to handle the zero day attack because nobody knows the zero day attack. That's the reason why it's da that damaging because nobody knows it. But you can actually check out which packages are with the problem before anybody else because you spend the five minutes in the morning just checking it up and you can elevate some defensive code or some defensive middleman or something that can defend you from that problem for example in most cases when there is some kind of security issue with node.js application you can always play a little bit with it just by yourself there are like 10 main attacks based on OWASP there are example codes for those attacks and you can just try them by yourself just try to DDoS your application, see how it reacts, try to put some kind of executable file inside of it, try to see how it's going to react. And you can do the whole protection by yourself. You can have some kind of basic defensive measures with like five to 10 minutes per day. It's not that big amount of time. And then I actually think you, you answered the second question. We had a question from Theodora about how, how do you lower the risk for potential zero days and I, I guess that's about being defensive but please yeah. <laughs> defense is the best in this case 
Yeah, and I think that applies to, to all frameworks. Defensive coding, never assume anything. Yes. I also saw some typing from Nico. Uh, is there a question coming there? Not or maybe I just haven't scrolled down. There we go. <laughs> yep. Uh, I notice in practice internal dependencies can be a challenge because they can obfuscate the underlying dependencies and you have uh, you need to have your tooling access the internal repositories. Do, do you have any recommendations there? Well, in most cases, for example, when I was in VMware, I had the ability to check some of the internal packages. Some are well hidden, but most of them were exposed. When you install that package to your repository and you run it inside your application, it is going to be part of your application. You can see where that package is used. For example, in endpoint user slash control something. And you can always try to just a simple attack that place. You can find if there are some kind of problems. But you know, in some cases, you're kind of with tight hands. You can do a lot more than just verify that the package is working at the moment. Because let's face it, when it's a big company and there are specific team that is working over some specific packages, they might do some kind of mistake, for example, with some serialization information or with some kind of reading of the files. And they can introduce something even after you tested it. So the best approach in this case is to have a really good automation QA because in most cases the automation QA is writing some kind of hacky tests. For example, in the VMware where we had a hacker QA who was actually trying to hack the package with some automation tests that are pushing those kind of information. For example, it is a pushing a broken zip file trying to directly broke the Linux machine where it's the whole thing is working. He was trying those kind of things and it was kind of the passive aggressive defensive behavior where you are actually attacking the whole package and seeing if it's going to be alive or not. And this was the only way to actually handle it, even if it's because it was coming off obfuscated and we were unable to do anything to that package. You just receive one URL where you install the package. That's it. And I'd like to thank you a lot, Dimitar. Very interesting. Much appreciated. And, and also, I, I, uh, I admire the bravery of, of doing a live demo. Uh, I like that. And I'm also happy that the, the tooling worked. So thank you very much.